Chapter 8 Ellen was up before the sun as was her habit the following morning. She was as quiet as possible as she left the room, careful not to wake Patrick. She hadn't even noticed when he'd finally gotten in bed, so it must have been very late. She went to the kitchen to talk to Alice for a moment like she always did. She sat at the table in the kitchen as the older woman worked. You didn't have to do the dishes. I always do the dishes from the weekend on Monday mornings. Alice turned from the stove and gave her a scolding glance. I didn't really have anything else to do. And I hate to see dishes sitting in the sink. It always makes me feel like I'm neglecting my duties. She shrugged, half embarrassed that she'd done them, but glad the woman hadn't noticed she'd scrubbed the kitchen floor as well. Alice smiled. Around here if you leave dishes in the sink, you're just doing what you're supposed to do which is leave them for me to take care of. Ellen shrugged. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do all day. I mean, I don't know anyone, so I can't exactly go visit people. You do all the cooking. Mrs. Smith does all the cleaning. There's a gardener to take care of the outside of the house. What's my job? She was getting desperate for something to do, but she tried to keep the anxiousness out of her voice when she asked the question. She thought again about volunteering at the orphanage, but would Patrick have a problem with her doing that so soon after they were married? Alice laughed. I can see you're not cut out to be the wife of a wealthy man. Maybe you could go visit your sister? Or you could find some volunteer work to do? Ellen bit her lip. Patrick showed me where Wesley's house is. I guess I could wander over there this morning and talk to Melinda. She paused for a moment looking at the older woman. Do you think he'd mind if I started volunteering so soon after we got married? I think that's a good idea. Alice glanced at the clock. I'd wait a couple of hours, though. Your sister isn't exactly an early riser. And no, I don't think he'd mind at all if you started volunteering right away. Surely he realizes there's little for you to do at home. Ellen laughed. No, she isn't one to get up at the crack of dawn. Patrick came into the kitchen then already dressed for work. I wondered where you'd disappeared to. He leaned down and brushed a kiss against her cheek. Ellen smiled up at him shyly. Do you have anything you need me to do today? Please think of something that needs to be done. He looked at her in confusion. Like what? She sighed. That's what I was afraid of. I'm going to go visit Melinda after breakfast. He didn't even understand she needed more to do with her time than sit around his house. He nodded. That sounds like fun. I need to go into work a little early this morning. She tried to hide her disappointment. Will you have time for breakfast first? He looked at the clock on the wall obviously torn. If we hurry, I will. Alice scooped some fried potatoes and eggs on two plates and added bacon. She handed both plates to Ellen. Here you go. I'll bring coffee in. Ellen carried the plates through to the dining room and sat in her regular spot at Patrick's right. What time do you think you'll be home tonight? He shrugged. I should be home on time, which is around 6 or 6.30. If I'm not, go ahead and eat without me. His mind was obviously already on the day ahead of him. Ellen picked up a piece of bacon and bit into it. Could I bring you lunch to the bank and we could eat together? She knew she was grasping at straws, but she didn't want to spend the day alone, and she was sure Melinda didn't want her underfoot all day. He thought about it for a moment, but the shook his head. I have lunch plans with a client. Maybe tomorrow we can do that. She nodded, trying to keep her resentment inside. Why had he sent off for a wife, when he obviously didn't want or need one? That's fine. Maybe I'll invite Melinda over here for lunch. Sounds like a fine idea. I'm glad your sister is here in town. She'll be good company until you have time to make friends with some of the other ladies in town. Ellen took a bite of her eggs. She shouldn't be upset, she knew. 
Most of the men she knew worked all day and spent only an hour or two with their wives in the evenings. Why had she expected anything different? He finished his last bite and stood, leaning down to briefly kiss her on the cheek. Have a good day. You too. She watched him leave and picked up her plate of breakfast that was only half gone. How could she eat when her marriage was already falling apart after only one day? Shouldn't they be doing their best to spend every waking moment together, instead of each of them rushing off to their own activities? Not that she had any activities to rush off to. She took both plates into the kitchen for Alice, and then went upstairs and made the bed. Mrs. Smith had told her last week that she didn't mind if she kept her own room clean, so she was going to continue on that way. She glanced at the clock and saw that it was a little after seven. Surely if she walked over to Melinda's she'd be awake by the time she got there. She went into the kitchen to let Alice know she was leaving. Alice glanced at the clock and gave her a look. Melinda isn't going to like it if you wake her. I'm sure she's up by now. She has to get Wesley's breakfast now. At least she hoped she was. If her sister was still in bed at this hour after the rocky start their marriage had, she deserved to be horsewhipped. Alice just nodded skeptically. Have a nice visit. Will you be back for lunch? I'm not sure. If I am, I can make something for myself. She shrugged, not really worried about what she'd eat. She'd barely eaten anything for two days anyway. She was certain her appetite wasn't going to suddenly come back while she was with her sister. Alice shook her head. What are we going to do with you, Ellen? You're going to have to get used to others doing for you. Ellen shrugged. I'm not sure if that's possible. She grinned and waved as she went out the door. She took her time walking across the small town, trying to give Melinda a little extra time to wake up. She hoped her sister had relented and apologized to Wesley, but was relatively certain she hadn't. Melinda was never good about admitting when she was wrong. She knocked softly on the door of the sheriff's house, just in case her sister was still asleep. Melinda came to the door immediately. She threw her arms around Ellen. I'm so glad you're here. Melinda grabbed Ellen's hand and pulled her into the house and back to the kitchen. He wants me to make fried chicken for lunch, and I have no clue how to fry a chicken. You always did it at home. Ellen laughed. It's good to be needed for something. She looked at the whole chicken lying on the counter and the mess from breakfast still scattered everywhere. And were those dishes from last night's dinner in the sink? How had her sister been raised in the same house she had? We need to start by getting the kitchen cleaned. I'll wash and you dry. She happily warmed some water on the stove to do the dishes with. So how are things going? Melinda burst into tears. He hates me. I told him I was sorry I asked for time before we consummated the marriage, and he said if he was that repulsive to me, then he didn't want to touch me. Ellen shook her head. She wanted to tell her sister she'd brought it on herself, but she knew the words would do no good. Well, let's make him the best lunch he's ever eaten, and you can beg his forgiveness. You think it's all my fault, don't you? Ellen shrugged. She did think the problems were her sister's fault, but she wasn't going to tell her that. As the younger sister, she'd been cassette more than she should have, and she needed to figure out what her husband needed and get things going well. She stuck her hands into the hot water and began scrubbing the dishes clean. As Ellen handed each dish to her sister, Melinda dried it and put it away. Once they were done with the dishes, she showed her sister how to cut up a chicken and how to make the batter for it. Fried chicken is really very simple. It's a flour-based coating and we'll just add a few spices to season it. Once the chicken was coated, she asked, are you going to make potatoes with it? Melinda's eyes widened. I have to make something with it? Ellen laughed. Where have you been all these years while we cook together? She stared at her sister in amazement. Have we ever served only meat for a meal with no side dishes? I've been doing whatever you told me to do. 
I've never really planned a meal or done it on my own. You were always there telling me what to do every single step of the way. I'm sorry. I should have made sure you knew how to do more things around the house. Ellen hadn't really considered that. Her sister had always done everything she told her to do, but she'd never taken the initiative to do things on her own. Was it simply because she had no idea what to do? Melinda shrugged. I'll make mashed potatoes. I know how to do that. Do you have any vegetables in the cellar? Ellen looked around for the trapdoor for the cellar she was certain was around somewhere. Cellar? Ellen put her hand on her sister's shoulder. I'll go look. Where are the potatoes? I don't know. They're probably in the cellar too. Let's go down and see what's there. Ellen moved the small rug on the floor, and just as she'd thought, there was the trap door to the cellar. Grab a lantern. Melinda got a lantern and they went down into the dark cellar together. Ellen looked around her and smiled. Good. You have a lot of foods down here. Alice told me she sent canned goods home with Wesley every fall and wasn't certain if he'd eaten them. There were shelves piled full of fruits and vegetables that had been canned and several bins with vegetables in them. Ellen went through and looked at each of the jars, noting that each had the date when they were canned written on them. She picked up a jar of green beans that had been canned the previous fall and handed it to her sister. Then she found a large bin of potatoes and picked out five large ones. This will be enough for just the two of you. Ellen had borrowed an apron before starting the dishes, so she carried the potatoes up the stairs in the skirt of her apron as her mother had taught her to do as a small girl. When they reached the top, she started peeling the potatoes while carefully explaining to Melinda how to fry a chicken. It would have been easier to do it herself, but she wanted Melinda to be able to do it the next time. Once the potatoes were on to boil, she put the green beans on the stove and then walked through the small house, looking for other ways to help her sister. While Melinda fried the chicken, Ellen made both of the beds and picked up the dirty clothes both of them had just tossed on the floor. She was so happy to have something to do she didn't even scold Melinda for leaving the house in such a sorry state. She walked back into the kitchen just as Melinda was removing the last of the chicken from the frying pan. Now all you need to do is mash the potatoes and make some gravy. Melinda stared at her in horror. Gravy? Ellen showed her how to make a simple gravy using the grease that was still in the frying pan. Now you have a feast, Ellen told Melinda as she poured the prepared gravy into a bowl. I'm going to go home now. You make things right with your husband. She hugged her sister tightly. Make sure he knows that you care about him. It's important. Will you come back after lunch? Melinda looked at the clock. Say around two. I might need more help. Ellen nodded slowly. I'd be happy to, but only to show you how to do things. Neither of our husbands will be happy if I come over here every day to cook and clean when you're supposed to be doing it. Ellen had a spring in her step as she walked home. At least for a little while she had something she could do to fill her days. Patrick was late for dinner again that evening, but she didn't mind as much, because she'd had something to fill her day. Once Melinda had figured out what to do around her own house, it was going to be frustrating that he was always gone. They sat down to eat at 8.30, and he reminded her again she didn't have to wait for him to eat. You can always start without me. I feel bad that you wait for me every night. She shrugged. I'd rather eat with you than eat alone. I'm used to having family around at mealtimes. She really hated the idea of eating alone, but she wasn't sure why. She could read a book while she ate to keep herself occupied, but she had a hard time doing it. She had eaten lunch in the kitchen so she could talk to Alice while she ate. Speaking of meals, I need to host a small dinner party on Friday night. I'm trying to make an arrangement with a bank in Denver that would allow our clients to do business there, and there's to do business here. I want to have the president and vice president of their bank, as well as the vice president of mine and all their wives for dinner. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate, and Alice will be able to help you, but I'll need you to plan it. 
Ellen nodded slowly. I've never done anything like that, but I'll do my best. She was suddenly nervous thinking about her first real job as his hostess. He squeezed her hand. I'll never ask for anything more. Are you working tonight? She held her breath while she waited for his answer, expecting him to spend all night in his office just as he had the evening before. He shook his head. Not tonight. I got everything I needed to do done at the bank today. She smiled, relieved. It would be nice to have his undivided attention for a change. Would you like to sit on the back porch? She hoped they could remember how much they cared about one another if they went back to the situation they'd been in so often while they were courting. He nodded his eyes weary. I'd like that. You're not too tired? She eyed him worriedly. He looked exhausted, and she realized he'd been up late working, and had risen early to go into work again. Should she just suggest he go off to bed? I'll be fine. He pushed away from the table and took her hand, leading her out to the porch. What did you do today? I went to visit my sister, and she was in a panic because Wesley told her he wanted fried chicken for lunch, and although we've made it together probably a hundred times, she had no clue how to do it. She'd just helped me. She grinned as she told him the story, holding onto his arm as they walked to the back of the house. He laughed. So did you do it for her? No, I made her do it, but I explained each step and wrote them down for her. Now she'll be able to do it herself next time. She was glad to be needed, but she knew her sister needed to be self-sufficient, and she'd do everything she could to get her there. Good. He sat on the swing and pulled her down beside him. Sounds like you had an exciting day. She shrugged. I'm just glad there was something to do. It was nice to help her with the housework because I felt useful for a change. She knew she shouldn't complain about being the wife to a rich man and having servants, but she couldn't help it. She hated sitting around idle. Well, now you have a dinner party to plan. I hope I do all right at that. Do you know what you want for dinner? What was she supposed to serve at a dinner party? Hopefully Alice would have some ideas about how he liked to do things. I have no idea. Whatever you feel like having Alice fix, I guess. She rested her head against his shoulder looking out over the garden. I'll figure something out. How formal do you want it to be? She hoped it wouldn't have to be terribly formal because she wasn't sure how she would manage that. It needs to be very formal. We'll need to hire maids to help serve the meal. It needs to be perfect. I hope I can manage perfect. She stifled a yawn. I'll talk to Alice about it first thing in the morning. I'm sure she'll have some ideas. What would she do without Alice? She seemed to know exactly what to do about everything. She was so glad the woman was there to help her. She will. We've done this a couple of times before. Okay. They sat in silence for a few moments, simply enjoying being together and listening to the sound of the Colorado night. Are you tired? he asked. She nodded. I'm always up before the sun comes up. Once a farm girl, always a farm girl. She stifled a yawn behind her hand. Well, go on up to bed. I'll be up in a minute. Ellen stood up and walked up the stairs. She quickly changed into her nightgown and got into bed. Within minutes, he was there, stripping and climbing into bed beside her. She turned into his arms, happy to be able to be with him again. After they'd made love, he fell asleep immediately, and she lay in his arms staring at the ceiling. She hoped she could do a good enough job on the dinner party. Melinda would have been thrilled to get to entertain a group of rich men and their wives. She couldn't help but wonder if they'd made a mistake by marrying the men they did. She was much more suited to doing housework and cooking than her sister was, and Melinda was more suited to dinner parties and being idle. She sighed. She could do what she needed to do. She loved Patrick, and she wasn't going to give him up because he expected her to do things that weren't what she was used to. Asterisk asterisk asterisk.
The week seemed to speed by. Every morning she went to her sister's house to help her with her chores. Melinda seemed much happier, but Ellen didn't feel like it was her place to know the intimate details of her sister's marriage, so she didn't ask any questions. Between the two of them, they'd get the house clean, just like they always had at home, and Melinda slowly learned how to cook meals for her husband. Ellen spent the afternoons at home planning the dinner party. She spoke with Mrs. Smith about hiring extra staff for the party, and spent hours with Alice planning the menu. Finally, she was satisfied that everything would be fine, but when it came time to dress for the party, she was racked by nerves. She was just a simple farmer's daughter. What did she know about entertaining bankers? At six on the dot, she went down the stairs to stand beside Patrick and wait for their guests to arrive. He slipped his arm around her shoulders and felt her shaking. Are you nervous? She smiled up at him. I'm petrified. She wanted to make a good impression on the others while making him proud. She hoped everything went without a hitch. He laughed. It's all going to be fine. What did you and Alice decide on for dinner? She made a vegetable soup to start, and then we'll have a special chicken dish she's assured me will go over well along with asparagus. For dessert she made some raspberry tarts that she's certain will make a good impression. I hope she's right. It's going to be fine. Just be polite and entertain the other ladies, while I talk business with the men. We'll eat at seven, and everything will go fine. She nodded nervously, biting her lip. I hope so. She wasn't sure if she'd be able to forgive herself if she did something wrong that cost him the deal he was trying to make. The first knock on the door came then, and they greeted their first guests, the president of the bank in Denver, Mr. Ernest, and his wife. Ellen smiled and talked with Mrs. Ernest, inviting her into the parlor to sit and chat. The Ernests were an older couple, in their sixties at least, and seemed very formal to Ellen. She took one of the chairs in the parlor while Mrs. Ernest took the sofa. Do you have any children? Ellen asked. Mrs. Ernest nodded. Oh, yes. We have two. Stanley works at the bank with Richard, and Beatrice and her husband have three children. The oldest just married and gave us our first great-grandchild. Ellen smiled. Oh, that's wonderful. I've always wanted to have a large family. How long have you been married? I wasn't aware that Mr. Harris had taken a wife. We were married on Saturday, so the news hasn't had time to travel around yet. She wondered if the older woman would have advice for her on being a banker's wife. Well, you have plenty of time for children then. Enjoy your time alone together. The other two women came in then. Mrs. Chandler was the wife of the vice president of Patrick's Bank, and Ellen had met her at the wedding, so she smiled happily knowing someone there. She introduced herself to the other lady, Mrs. Merriweather. Mrs. Harris was just telling me she only got married last Saturday, Mrs. Ernest told the others. Congratulations, Mrs. Merriweather said, smiling warmly. Mrs. Merriweather looked to be in her thirties, while Mrs. Chandler was closer to Ellen's own age. Thank you. Ellen hated being in the spotlight, but she knew her new marriage would put her there repeatedly. Ellen looked at the clock and realized they had 15 minutes before dinner, so she tried to come up with a topic. How long have you been married, Mrs. Merriweather? The older woman smiled at her. Oh, 17 years. That's a long time to be a banker's wife. Mrs. Ernest nodded. I've been a banker's wife for over 40 years. I think the first five years were the hardest. Never knowing when he'd come home and eating alone almost every night. Mrs. Chandler laughed. Never knowing when they'll work all night after they get home and ignore you. Ellen's eyes were wide as she listened to the other women. I thought it was just me. She was thrilled to hear that her husband wasn't meaning to neglect her. He was just doing what all bankers did. Mrs. Ernest shook her head. It's all bankers, my dear. We all joke about being bankers' widows. It's like our husbands come home to sleep, but never spend time with us. 
Ellen sighed. So it's not going to get any better? She'd hoped that Patrick would someday be able to spend more time with her, but it sounded like they'd be raising any children they had together alone. The other women laughed. Poor Ellen, Mrs. Chandler said. You'll get used to it. She saw by the clock it was time to go into dinner. If you'll follow me? She strode toward the dining room. She really wished she'd had a chance to talk to these women in depth before she'd married Patrick. Not that she would have made a different choice, but at least she would have been prepared. She was starting to think the only time he realized he was married was when they were in bed together at night. She blushed immediately after having that thought as if the others could hear her thoughts. She took the seat at the foot of the table as she'd promised Patrick she would, and the other women grouped around her while the men went to the other end of the table. The women changed their topic to children, and she discovered that Mrs. Chandler had a little girl who was only a year old while Mrs. Merriweather had four children. She'd had three girls and kept trying until she had a boy. A man needs a boy to carry on the family name. For the first time Ellen wondered if her father had been disappointed to only have girls. He'd never said anything if he was. The other women all seemed to know one another, and Ellen found the job of keeping the conversation going very easy. At times, she would pick up pieces of the topic from the men's end of the table. They seemed to be having a good time discussing the logistics of the plans they'd made. As much as Ellen had been dreading the dinner, she felt like she could have a true friend in Elizabeth Chandler and hoped to get to know her better. She was certain, if nothing else, they'd be thrown together over and over socially. She wondered how Melinda would have fit into the party, and was sad to admit, she would have done a much better job at steering the conversation and keeping the other women occupied. She enjoyed social settings so much more than Ellen did. After dinner the women once again retired to the parlor, while the men went to Patrick's study. The women talked about the different things to do in Denver, none of which Ellen had experienced. There's a wonderful theater there. You must go, Elizabeth told her. Yes, you should, echoed Mrs. Ernest. And when you do, be sure to let us know, and we can all have dinner at a restaurant there in town. She smiled. I'm afraid I don't entertain as much as I used to. I don't mind going to dinner parties, but hosting them has become a chore in my old age. I'm ready for Richard to retire so we can just enjoy the grandchildren. Ellen smiled. I'll make sure we do that. I don't know how to make sure of it, but I will. Maybe I can offer to drive so he can work along the way. She did her best to keep a straight face as she made the suggestion. That might work. Mrs. Merriweather laughed. The Chandlers stayed for a bit after the two other couples had left for the evening. It does get better, Elizabeth told Ellen. Are you sure? Ellen hoped it did because she didn't want to spend the rest of her life thinking she didn't matter to her husband. Elizabeth nodded. I don't know if it gets better because they realize they're ignoring you and spend more time paying attention to you, or if it's because we get used to it. Either way, in a few months you'll be fine with it. But what do you do all day? Ella knew her voice sounded desperate, but she'd reached a point where if she didn't have something constructive to do, she would lose her mind. Elizabeth laughed. Now that I have Annabelle, I spend my days with her. I take her to the park and we play. I feed her and my life revolves around her nap times. She shrugged. Before she was born, I did some volunteer work at the local church. I'd take meals to shut-ins and that sort of thing. I always expected to keep house for a man to cook and clean and use my skills to take care of my home. I feel at a loss. I spend most mornings with my sister, because she's just learning to cook, but the afternoons are mine. I've had this party to plan all week, but I don't know what I'll do now. She really was at a loss for something to do. If she hadn't been new to town, she would surely have friends to invite over or to go visit, but she'd been there less than two weeks. She only knew a handful of people. Why don't you talk to Patrick about it? I'm sure you can find some sort of volunteer work to do. Or you could redecorate the house. Ellen bit her lip as she thought about it. 
I did meet some orphans the first week I was here. I could go work with the orphans. Do you know if they need help? She hadn't been able to get the orphans out of her mind. She knew taking an active role in their lives was what she wanted more than anything. Hopefully Patrick would agree. The orphanage always needs help. They need people to help with the children and to cook and clean. If you're interested, I think that would be a great place to start. I'll talk to Patrick about that and see what he thinks. Surely he has to understand that I'll lose my mind if I sit around doing nothing all day every day. I love being his wife, of course, but I don't love having nothing to do. He'll understand. I went through the same thing when I was first married. I was certain I would adore being in the lap of luxury and not having to lift a finger for anything. It took me all of a month to hate doing nothing. I begged him to quit his job and fire all the servants so I'd have something to do with my time. Ellen laughed. He didn't agree? She could just picture the scene if she asked Patrick to quit his job and fire the servants. Elizabeth shook her head, her blue eyes dancing with laughter. No, he told me to find something to do and let him get back to work. What else would he say? After the Chandlers had left, Ellen went into Patrick's office to talk about the things she and Elizabeth had discussed. She sat down in the chair opposite his desk and waited until he lifted his head to look at her. I think the party went very well. Thank you for all your hard work getting it ready. She smiled at the compliment. I'm glad you were happy with it. She looked down at her hands for a minute, trying to choose the right words to broach the subject she needed to discuss. After talking with the other women, I realized that our marriage is normal for a banker's marriage. I thought it was odd that you were spending no time with me, but now I understand. I do need something to do with my time, though, so I wondered if you would be amenable to me volunteering at the orphanage in town. She really loved the idea of spending time with children. She would have preferred spending every waking moment with him, but there was no way that could happen. He sighed and put his pen down. I'm sorry. I was hoping to have more time to spend with you, but I just don't. I'm not upset about it. Anymore, she added honestly. But you were? She shrugged. We spent more time together while we were courting than we do now. I mean, you'd come over every evening and we'd have time to talk and sit together on the back porch. Now you come home from work late every night, and then you work in your study most evenings after dinner. She paused thinking carefully about her words. I know you're busy, but I need something to do. I've spent my whole life working. Sitting around all day doesn't work for me. That's fine. Go to the orphanage tomorrow and see if they can use you. I'm sure there's something they need if only someone to sit with the babies while someone else cooks the meals. If that will make you happy, then I'm all for it. I don't want you to be bored or unhappy. Thank you. I was hoping you'd feel that way about it. It's so hard for me to be idle. She hoped it wasn't coming off as if she was complaining, because she loved him, and she was happy being married to him. He walked around the desk and took her hand, pulling her to her feet. Leaning down to kiss her softly, he said, I'm glad you married me. I'm very happy in our marriage. I just want you to know that. She nodded. I do know that, and I'm happy, too. I just wish we could spend more time together. I do too. There's nothing I'd rather do than spend time with you, but I can't sit around all day either. I need to work. She snuggled against him. Just so I know you'd rather be with me, I'm happy. His arms went around her holding her against him. I'd definitely rather be with you. Chapter 9 After church on Sunday, Patrick and Ellen invited Wesley and Melinda for a picnic lunch in the park. Patrick would have to put in a few hours in his study that evening, but he had some time to spare, and he knew Ellen was worried about the other couple's marriage. While they ate, Ellen couldn't help but wonder what was going on between Wesley and Melinda. She'd thought they'd worked their problems out earlier in the week, but they were very obviously strained. 
While the men were eating the cookies she packed for dessert, Ellen pulled Melinda off to go for a walk around the park. Are you two okay? Ellen made certain to keep her voice low so no one would hear them. The park was fairly busy with picnicking families. Melinda shook her head fiercely. I just think I've made a huge mistake marrying Wesley. Ellen closed her eyes for a moment. I thought you two were doing better. How long was Melinda going to be unhappy in her marriage? She'd married a man she loved. Surely, they could overcome their problems. Melinda shrugged. Well we are in some ways. But he knows I wanted to marry someone who had more money than he does. Please tell me you didn't complain about his salary. Melinda shook her head. Of course not. I know I have a problem with speaking when I shouldn't, but even I know better than that. Then what happened? He was right there when I got angry with you for deciding to marry Patrick and ignoring my feelings. No matter what I say to try to make him feel better about it, he's still angry. He's not mean to me in any way, but the open affection he showed me while we were courting is just gone. Marriage changes things. Patrick doesn't have nearly as much time for me as he did before we married. She'd been careful not to complain about her marriage to Melinda, because she knew she and Patrick were doing much better than Melinda and Wesley were. He doesn't? Wesley actually has more time for me, but it seems as if he's unhappy with everything I do. Does that make sense? Ellen nodded. It does. Even though Patrick seldom had time for her, she knew that he was pleased with her, because he told her constantly. Maybe she should have Patrick talk to Wesley about how Melinda was feeling. Immediately Ellen rejected the idea. The other couple needed to work out their problems. If Wesley went to Patrick, then it would be okay, for Patrick to get involved. Until then, both Ellen and Patrick needed to keep from approaching Wesley. I don't know what I'd do if you didn't come over every morning to help me with the cooking. I don't want to displease him, but I can't seem to do anything else. Ellen sighed. Starting tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to start going to the orphanage here in town to volunteer. I have way too much time on my hands. She wanted Melinda to understand that she wouldn't be at her back and call any longer. She'd help her in the mornings, but soon she'd have to stand on her own two feet. I feel like all I do is work. Of course, I don't mind it as much as I used to because I like doing things for the man I love. Ellen looked at her sister. Love? Have you told him you love him? Melinda looked down at the ground and shook her head. He's certain that I'll say anything to make it better so he wouldn't believe me. He's really hurt over the way I reacted to you marrying Patrick. He thinks I should have been thrilled the decision was made for me and just jumped into his arms ready to say I do. Ellen laughed. He doesn't know you at all, does he? How could any man think Melinda wanted decisions made for her after knowing her for more than an hour? Melinda grinned. Maybe not as well as he thinks he does. Ellen slipped her arm through her sister's as they continued their walk around the outskirts of the park. It'll get better. Just keep doing everything you can to be a good wife to him, and things will work out. You'll see. She hoped she was right. She'd expected Melinda and Wesley to enjoy being married with how much they liked being together, but so far, that hadn't been the case. I hope so. She kicked at a rock on the ground sending it careening into a towering oak tree. I just wish I hadn't messed things up so badly. He'll come to understand why you felt as you did. I told him about the banker back home and I think that helped him understand a little. You told him about that? Ellen nodded. Of course, I did. He needed to understand why you feel as you do. I've never talked to him about it. Maybe that's part of your problem. If you two can't talk about something as simple as that, then your marriage isn't going to work. Well, I have to say, you don't look like you're in the bloom of love anymore either. You looked like you were much happier a week ago. Melinda eyed her older sister. Something's bothering you, too. Ellen sighed. I just wish he'd put me ahead of his work. 
He works so hard to make more and more and more money, when we already have enough for a lifetime. I don't know why he can't spend some time with me instead of spending all his time working. Melinda laughed softly. I guess neither of us have the lives we dreamed about when we were courting, do we? She put her arm around her sister and hugged her. We'll get there. It takes time to build up a good marriage. Promise me you'll talk openly with Wesley about what happened with the banker back home. I don't want him to think you're hiding things from him. That's probably part of the problem you're having with him. Why wasn't Melinda opening up to her husband anyway? I promise. When they rejoined the men, they seemed to be deep in conversation. They stopped talking when the women approached. Are you ready to go home? Patrick asked. Ellen nodded. She'd have preferred to spend all day with the other couple in the park, but she knew that Patrick had work to do. At least she could cook dinner that evening. She found she was thankful for Alice's days off, because it gave her a chance to do some work. Ellen and Melinda packed up the picnic basket and hugged. I'll see you tomorrow morning, Ellen told her sister. Melinda's eyes cut over to Wesley as if she hadn't wanted him to hear that. Ellen sighed. Her sister really did need to be more open with her husband. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. When Ellen arrived at the orphanage Monday afternoon, they were thrilled to have her. She was immediately put to work fixing dinner, because the other women were busy with the laundry. Mondays are hard because we try to do all the laundry on top of everything else we have to do around here. Ellen smiled. I'd be thrilled to do the cooking. She headed straight for the kitchen and found the food that had been left out for dinner that evening. There was a huge pot of beans soaking and some bacon for flavoring. It wasn't much to work with. Ellen couldn't help but wonder how often the orphans had to make do with beans when she was eating like a queen just a few streets over. Two of the teenage girls were assigned to help her, and she decided while they cooked the beans, they could spend time getting the kitchen in order. It was obvious that it was all the women who worked there could do to keep the children fed and clothed. There was little time left for cleaning. The girls helped her move the table out of the way and the three of them got down on their hands and knees and scrubbed the kitchen floor. She'd been there for several minutes when there was a loud bang as the kitchen door was slammed open against the wall. I'm sorry I'm late. Ellen looked up to see Angela, the girl who had helped her with her hair. Are you late? Angela nodded. I was supposed to be here to help with cooking dinner. Ellen hadn't realized Angela was one of the orphans. She suddenly felt badly that she hadn't offered her money for helping her with her hair that day. She wondered if Alice had, and determined to ask her later. Angela dropped to her knees with the others, and helped scrub the huge floor. When they were finished, they scrubbed the walls as well. Ellen assigned Angela to cleaning the table while the other two girls were washing down the work tables. How long have you lived here? Ellen asked Angela as she worked on cleaning the chairs around the kitchen table. My parents died five years ago when I was eleven. I've been here ever since. I'm sorry. I lost my mother when I was twelve and my father just a couple of months back. She was thankful she hadn't lost both parents at such a young age, though. At least she'd been an adult and able to fend for herself. Angela nodded solemnly. It's hard to lose a parent. How did they die? My dad was a miner, and he got trapped in a cave-in. Mum decided she was going to get him out, and she went in and dug and dug. I took her food and water, because she refused to leave until she got him out. She stared down at the table, rubbing her rag in slow circles. She managed to get herself trapped along with him. I went for help, but they were both dead by the time they were found. I'm so sorry. Ellen's mind raced as she wondered how she could help this sweet girl. She certainly had skills as a hairdresser. Maybe Patrick would know of someone who needed a lady's maid or a nurse for their children. It's not so bad living here. The people are nice, and there's plenty of food. She looked at the pot on the stove. Even if it is beans most nights. Ellen laughed. 
We ate beans a lot when I was growing up, too. She remembered hating them, but at least she'd had food every day. She was certain Angela felt the same way. Where did you grow up? On a small farm in Massachusetts. We lived on a farm when I was little, but my dad was certain he could make us rich with the gold mines. My ma tried to talk him out of it, but he just didn't want to listen. She shrugged. Sometimes, you just have to do what the people you love want to do to make them happy. Ellen finished the last chair and stood up looking around the kitchen for something else they could all do. Let's wash the windows next. The girls all groaned, but moved on to the windows. You make us work harder than the other women who come here, Angela told her. Are there a lot of women who come to help? Ellen was pleased to hear the two women who worked there had volunteers helping them. Taking care of 30 children and a house this size was way too much work for just two women even if they did have teens to help them. Angela shrugged. There are a few, but most of them just sit around and tell us what to do. They don't actually roll up their sleeves and help. For a rich lady, you sure do know how to work. I've only been a rich lady for a little over a week. I'm used to being a poor girl. Angela nodded. That makes sense then. The other ladies are all used to being rich. I'm sure in a few months you'll be used to it, too. Ellen shook her head emphatically. I certainly hope not. I never want to forget how to work. I hate sitting around and doing nothing. She couldn't see going to the orphanage and just telling the girls what to do. She would work beside them as much as she could. Ellen stayed and helped serve dinner to the children. She kept watching the clock, but knew there was little chance Patrick would be home before 8, so decided she could stay until 7.30 with no problem. She helped clear the table and wash the dishes thinking about how nice it would be if she could bring some food to help out. The children would certainly love having a meal that wasn't primarily beans. She knew beans were inexpensive and filling, and it made sense for the children to eat them, because there were so many mouths to feed, but she'd seen the look on Angela's face when she'd looked at the pot. She washed the dishes while her three teenaged helpers dried and put them away. She worked fast enough to keep up with all three of them with no problem. By the time 7.30 rolled around the kitchen was spotless. She sought out Ida, whom she'd first met at the park, and promised to be back immediately after lunch on Tuesday. She hoped she could get her sister sorted out with her cooking quickly, because she found she wanted to spend every waking moment helping at the orphan's home. It was a few minutes after eight when she walked into the house, and she opened the door with a smile on her face. She was thrilled to have been able to do something for others for a change. Her smile fell away when she saw Patrick leaning against the wall in the foyer watching for her. He looked angry, which surprised her, because she'd never seen him anything but happy. What's wrong, she asked. What's wrong? I've been waiting for you for two hours. Where have you been? I've been worried sick. You never get home before eight. Her eyes went to the clock on the wall. It's only five minutes after. I thought I'd get here before you. He crossed his arms over his chest. And just where have you been all this time? She removed her bonnet and put it on the small table beside the stairs so she could take it up when she went up later. We talked Friday night about me volunteering at the orphanage. I went there today. I thought you meant to go for an hour or two in the afternoon. Alice said you left just after noon. You were there for eight hours. His face was red with anger. She bit her lip to keep from yelling back at him. He left her alone for twelve hours per day, and complained when she spent eight of them doing something to help others? The need was worse than we'd realized. I fixed dinner, scrubbed the kitchen down, and then I helped serve the children their dinner, and did the dishes afterward. You're never home before eight, so I had no idea it would bother you if I was out late. I didn't think you cared what I did during the twelve hours a day you spend away from me as long as you didn't have to be bothered with me. The last two words ended on a yell, despite her best intentions. Of course, I care what you do. 
I expect you to be here when I get home in the evenings. What if something had happened to you? If I had an idea when you would be home, I'd be certain to be here, but I never know when you'll show up. What were you doing home before eight anyway? How dare he change his schedule without warning her and then yell at her for not conforming to it? What was his problem? He took a deep breath, obviously trying to control his temper. I came home early so I could take my wife to the restaurant for dinner, because I felt like I'd been neglecting her. I had no idea she preferred it when I wasn't home. She sighed and walked to him, putting her hand on his chest. You know I prefer it when you're home. I just get so bored during the day. I needed something to do. When there was so much to be done, I just kept going. I didn't think there was any real reason to rush home. If you'd let me know when you planned to be here, I'd be certain I was here when you arrived. I wanted to surprise you. I'm sorry I ruined your surprise. She meant it, too. She loved that he'd cared enough to leave work earlier than usual to surprise her with an evening out. She was very sorry to have ruined it. We're not too late to go to the restaurant. Do you want to go? She looked down at her dress which was covered with dirt. I'll need to change and wash my face and hands. I've been on my hands and knees all day. She knew she was filthy, but she was so happy to have been doing something for others that she didn't mind at all. He rubbed a smudge of dirt off her cheek with his thumb. I can see that. He dropped a kiss on her lips. Hurry and change. I'll wait. She rushed up the stairs and changed quickly, splashing water on her face and hands from the pitcher on the dresser. She quickly fixed her hair and hurried back down the stairs. I'm ready. He held out his arm to her. Let's go then. During their walk she told him all about her day and the different things that needed to be done at the orphanage. There's a girl there named Angela. She did my hair for our wedding. She lost her parents when she was 11, and she's lived at the orphanage ever since. I've never seen anyone work so hard. He opened the door to the restaurant for her and followed her in. They were seated by the window. I think I've met Angela. She's so sweet. I wish there was a way we could get her out of there. She didn't realize how wistful her voice sounded as she spoke about the teenager. He sighed. You know we can't adopt all the orphans, right? I know. I just want to help this one. Do you know of anyone who could use a lady's maid? She is wonderful with hair. Or maybe there's someone who needs a nurse for their children. She's really good with the younger children. He shook his head slowly. I don't know of anyone, but I'll ask around. Thank you. She looked down at her plate before taking a bite of the fish he'd ordered for her. Do you think we could take them some food too? They eat beans at least six nights a week. They're all so sick of beans. That we can do. Why don't I have Albert, the gardener, drive you over to the orphanage tomorrow and you can stop and pick up some meat at the butcher's on the way over? Would that make you feel better? It's not about how I feel. It's about helping others. I hate there are so many kids squeezed into that small house. I wish I could take them all home with me. He grinned. Well, I really don't think that's an option. I mean, I love kids, but there are over 20 of them, aren't there? She nodded. And they live in a four-bedroom house. She hadn't had much growing up, but at least she'd had only one other person to share a bedroom with. We'll do what we can to help, but we can't take them all home with us. I know. I just wish we could. They ate the rest of their meal in silence as she tried to think of ways to help the children. There had to be more she could do. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. The other women were thrilled when she got to the orphanage the following day. She had brought enough food for the children to have a good meal. She decided to make them pot roast with fresh bread and vegetables. She had the same three teen helpers as before, and the four of them worked together to fix the meal. 
When there was a lull in the cooking, she took them all into the dining room to give it the same kind of cleaning they'd given the kitchen the day before. By the time dinner time rolled around, the dining room was spotless. All of the children were excited by the special meal. No beans, shouted a tow-headed boy of about 14. She'd learned while they cleaned that the only meat they tended to eat was the meat the boys were able to hunt for. During the summer months the three teenaged boys in residence would go out into the woods adjacent to the orphanage and see how much meat they could bring in. Sometimes it would only be a squirrel or a rabbit, but they would use whatever they had to flavor their beans. If they were lucky and got a deer, they would be able to eat meat for a few days before going back to their regular diet of beans. The orphanage had a small hen house, but they used all the eggs they found in their baking or for breakfast, so the little bit of extra food the hunting brought in helped immensely. Ellen was careful to leave at 5.30 that evening, so she could be certain to make it home before Patrick did. She felt he'd overreacted the night before, but she didn't want to risk him getting angry with her two nights in a row. To her surprise, he was waiting for her when she walked into the house. You're home, she said happily running into his arms. I should be home by this time every night. How? She pulled away looking up at him in astonishment. I hired another man to work in the bank. He's going to take some of the load off of Mr. Chandler and me so we can both spend more time with our families. Thank you. She hugged him fiercely thrilled he had made the change for her. He smiled. It's not just for you. I'm a newlywed too, and enjoy spending time with my new wife. They walked into the dining room where Alice was setting the food on the table. She winked at Ellen as she set down the carved pork roast and left. Ellen once again was full of stories about the orphanage, and he talked about the new man at the bank. She was thrilled to be able to talk to him about her day and actually have something to say. The orphanage is at capacity now, she told him. I asked what would happen if more children came and they said they'd have to turn them away. She stabbed her meat. Can you imagine turning orphans away because there's no room? I'll tell you what. If more come and there's no room, we can take one. She squealed and ran around the table to hug him. Do you mean it? He sighed. I can see nothing would make you happier, so yes, that would be okay. She sat back down and enjoyed her meal. You know a gift like that is better than diamonds, don't you? He nodded. But it would be so much easier just to give you diamonds. She laughed. I never promised to be an easy wife, did I? I really don't remember that being in the vows. Chapter 10 That week set a pattern for the following months. Every morning Ellen went to Melinda's to help her with her cooking skills, although Melinda was learning rapidly, and it was obvious Ellen was no longer needed. They both enjoyed spending their mornings together, so neither of them put an end to it. Melinda seemed happier in her marriage than she had, and she confessed to Ellen she told Wesley a lot more about her thoughts and feelings. Every afternoon, she went to the orphanage and spent time with the children. She cooked, cleaned, and changed diapers. She found she was in her element there, and other than spending time with Patrick, it was her favorite thing to do. She'd been working at the orphanage for a little over four weeks when she heard a knock on the door. She didn't see anyone else, so she went to the door. There, on the ground, was a baby who was obviously a newborn. She looked both ways, and didn't see anyone, so she picked it up. On a note pinned to the small blue blanket wrapped around it were the words, Please take care of my little boy. His name is Jonathan. His father died, and I can't support him. Please find a family who will love him. The baby was sound asleep, and Ellen carried him inside. One of the older boys had left the previous week, so she knew there'd be room for him. She took him to Ida and showed her the note. Ida shook her head sadly. I don't know what we'll do with him. There are no beds left in the baby room. But one of the boys left last week. Surely there's room for him. Ida sighed. It doesn't work that way. If a baby had left, we'd have room, but it was one of the teenage boys. 
If we'd gotten a boy over three, he could have bunked in with the older boys, and everything would have been fine. We have no room for a baby boy. She made a face. I guess we'll have to wire the orphanage in Denver to see if they have room. Ellen shook her head. There's no need. I'm taking him home with me. Patrick had said she could take home the next child who couldn't stay at the orphanage, and she was going to take him at his word. You can't take a baby home with you. You're newly married. You need time alone with your husband. Ellen bit her lip, considering what the other woman was saying. You're right. We do need time alone. So I'll take Angela as well, and she can be his nurse. She wasn't sure how Patrick would react to her bringing home two of the orphans, but Angela would be a huge help to her, and would free up another bed in the orphanage. What will your husband say? Ellen shrugged. She really wasn't certain. It'll be fine. She stood looking down at the tiny child in her arms, and she knew it really would be okay. He had already agreed to take in the next child the orphanage couldn't hold, and she was bringing home someone who would take care of the new baby. How could he complain about that? She went and found the teenager in the kitchen. She was watching over the pot of rabbit stew they were having for supper. Angela? Angela looked up and saw the baby in Ellen's arms. We got a new one. Where are they going to put him? There's no room. Even though her words were negative the young girl automatically reached for the baby. Ellen watched the younger girl's face as she took the baby in her arms and cradled him against her. His name is Jonathan. She reached out and stroked her finger down the cheek of the sweet baby. What happens now? Angela asked sadly. Are they seeing if the home in Denver has room for him? She stared down at the baby, as concerned for him as Ellen was. Ellen shook her head. They were going to, but I thought I'd take him home with me. She watched the younger girl's face to see what her reaction would be. Angela's eyes widened. What will Mr. Harris say? He told me I could take home the next child who couldn't be kept here. So the orphanage is going to lose you? Angela sighed. We'll really miss you around here, Mrs. Harris. You've been great. She stared down at the baby, seeming upset. Ellen understood how she felt. The two of them had become very close during the time she'd volunteered at the orphanage. Well, I have an idea that would make it so I could take him home with me and still work here some. She looked at the red head as her eyes lifted. The tears shimmering there gave her hope the girl would like the idea. I was hoping I could hire you to be his nurse. You could help me with him, and I could still have time for the orphanage. Of course, I have to talk to my husband about it, but I think it would be the perfect solution. Angela's face lit up. Me? You want me to come live with you in your big house? Ellen nodded with a smile. That's exactly what I want. Would you mind? She could already tell by the girl's face that she loved the idea, but she asked anyway. I'd love to. Ellen left Angela sitting at the table, cooing over the baby as she stirred the pot on the stove. I'll get one of the other girls to take over here, and we can go upstairs and get your things together. Angela looked at her with a look of trepidation. Aren't you going to talk to Mr. Harris first? Ellen shook her head. She knew talking to Patrick first would be the right thing to do, but she didn't have time. There was no room for the baby in the orphanage, and she needed to get diapers and milk for him before it was time for him to sleep. No, there's too much to be done today. One of the other teenagers, a girl named Madeline, walked into the kitchen. Maddie, would you mind taking over the supper preparations? I need Angela upstairs. Maddie shook her head. No, ma'am. She walked to the stove and immediately started stirring, looking over her shoulder in wonder. Ellen took the baby from Angela and followed the girl out of the room and upstairs. She hadn't spent much time in the upper floor of the house, always working in the kitchen and on cleaning the main rooms instead. Which room is yours? Angela opened a door with ten beds lining the walls. 
She walked to a bed on one end of the room and knelt down, reaching for something under the bed. She pulled out a small wooden crate that obviously was what she used as a dresser. One more reach under the bed, and she took out a rag doll that looked as if it had seen better days. Removing her apron she put her spare dress, nightgown and underclothes, which was all she had on top of the apron. She added the doll and then used the ties from the apron to wrap around the clothing to keep it all in a tight ball. There. I'm ready. She shrugged in embarrassment. The doll is all I have left from my time with my parents, so I want to keep it. I know it's childish. Ellen had thought she had little when she'd left their little farm in Massachusetts, but watching this young girl with everything she owned tied up in an apron, she knew she'd grown up wealthy compared to her. They walked down the stairs and spoke with Ida. Tomorrow's Saturday, and I'm not going to be here. I'll take a couple of days to get the children settled in my house. I should be here Monday afternoon, though. Ida nodded. I'm glad you're taking them home with you. We hate having to turn any children away. Ellen nodded. I do understand, and we certainly won't be able to take in all of the children, but we can help today. She cradled the baby close to her as she walked out of the house with Angela trailing behind her. I'm looking forward to staying with you and Mr. Harris, Angela told her. Ellen smiled. You'll like it there. You already know Alice, and Mrs. Smith is nice as can be. She looked at the younger girl for a moment. How do you know Alice? She lived on a farm right along the path we took to town when we needed supplies. She and my mother were friends, and she wanted to take me in when my parents died, but her husband said they didn't have room, so I came here. She sighed. I've always thought of her as another mother. Ellen wondered if Patrick had known any of their history. Surely he would have agreed to let Angela live with them if he'd known how close she was to Alice. She opened the door and led Angela into the kitchen where Alice was preparing dinner. We have an extra for dinner for a while. Alice turned and saw Angela, her arms immediately stretching out to hug the young girl. You'll be staying here? Angela nodded, wiping away a tear. Mrs. Harris is going to adopt the new baby left at the orphanage, because there's no room. So she brought me to be his nurse. Alice smiled warmly. Mr. Patrick is certainly in for a surprise when he gets home. Ellen grinned at the baby sleeping in her arms. I need to go to the mercantile to see if I can get some things for him. The only thing I'm worried about is a cradle. How will we find a cradle on such short notice? They sometimes have them in the mercantile, Alice told her. Not often, but there are a couple of miners who make furniture and sell it so they'll be able to eat and keep working their claims for just a little longer. I'll go check. She carefully handed the baby to Angela and knew that Alice and Mrs. Smith would get her and Jonathan settled in while she was gone. Have the gardener drive you. That way, if you do find what you need, you'll be able to bring it home with no problem. Tell him to take the wagon and not the buggy, though. Ellen nodded. I'll do that. She was home an hour later with a new cradle, diapers, and fabric to make some clothes for the baby. She'd also picked up several bolts of cloth to make new clothes for Angela. Glancing at the clock, she saw that Patrick was due home any minute. She paced nervously in the foyer as she waited for him. How would he react to her just bringing home two of the orphans without really talking to him about it first? Would he be angry, or would he just accept it? Patrick opened the door, and she rushed to his side to kiss his cheek in greeting. You're home. He laughed softly. I'm home at this time every night. She bit her lip. Well, it's not every night I'm waiting to talk to you when you arrive. What was the best way to tell him? He raised an eyebrow and looked at her. What's wrong? She took his hand and led him into the parlor, sitting on the couch and drawing him down beside her. Nothing's really wrong, but I'm afraid you'll be angry because of something I did today. What did you do? He looked at her with curious eyes. I brought home two of the orphans. He sighed. Two? 
I thought we'd decided you could bring one home, but only if the house became too full. She bit her lip. I know, but I felt I needed to. She briefly explained about Jonathan being left on the doorstep, and how she and Ida had felt they needed a little more time alone before they added an infant, so she'd brought home Angela to take care of the baby. He shrugged. Okay. Well, what's done is done. You only brought one to keep, and the other is here to help. I can understand that. You're not angry? She felt the relief wash over her at his mild reaction. He shook his head. Honestly, I'm surprised you were able to wait as long as you did before you brought one home. He took her hand in his. We'll talk about a salary for Angela after dinner. Where are they anyway? She threw her arms around his neck and hugged him tightly, kissing him. Thank you so much. You're the best husband ever. He laughed. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I never came home on time and practically ignored you the day after we married. All forgiven. She stood up and grabbed his hand, pulling him up the stairs. I want you to see him. His name's Jonathan, but if you don't like it, I'm sure we could change it. She practically danced up the stairs with him in tow. He shook his head, amused by her enthusiasm. Jonathan is fine. She opened the door and saw that Angela was leaning over the baby changing his diaper and talking to him softly. This is Angela. Angela nodded at Patrick, obviously a little nervous. Hello, Angela said softly. He smiled at her before his eyes drifted to the baby lying on his back on the dresser. This must be Jonathan. Angela finished pinning his diaper and handed him to Patrick, who held him at arm's length, one hand under each arm. Patrick gave Ellen a look of absolute terror and she giggled softly. Ellen reached out and took the baby and held him in one arm with practiced ease. They don't break. Patrick shook his head. That's a good thing, because if they did, I'm sure I'd be the one to break him. He backed to the doorway of the room, smiling as he watched her handling the baby. I'm really glad he comes with a nurse. Angela took the baby from Ellen and carried him down the stairs while she got a bottle for him. Ellen led Patrick down the stairs. It's time for dinner. I was planning on having Angela eat with us, but she may not be able to tonight. She looked back at Patrick over her shoulder. Did you know she thinks of Alice as a mother? Patrick stopped. I had no idea. How do they know one another? She briefly explained what Angela had told her. I didn't know before I asked her to come here, but now I'm really glad I did. I think it'll be good for both of them. He nodded absently. I wish Alice had said something. He looked toward the kitchen where Angela had gone with the baby. So her parents died in a mining accident? Ellen nodded. I think it's sad her father put money over a happy family. She shrugged. We never had much growing up, but I never doubted the love of either of my parents. Of course, I wish my father had been clearer about our money situation, but I'm sure he didn't expect to die. They sat down at the dining room table and waited, knowing that Alice would be there with their meals in a moment. That night, while they were lying in bed, Ellen said, I want to thank you again for letting me bring him home with me today. I can see it makes you happy and that's what matters the most to me. He looked straight into her eyes as he said, I love you. Ellen felt her heart skip a beat. She'd known she loved him almost from the moment she'd met him, but she'd been careful not to say the words. She felt like meeting someone and immediately loving them was something that only happened in fairy tales, so she was thrilled he returned her feelings. I've loved you from the first. He brushed a kiss across her lips, pulling her close to him in the big bed, his hands skimming down her back. Why didn't you say anything before now? She shrugged. I didn't want you to feel as if you had to say the words back to me. I thought maybe it was too soon, or you'd never feel the same way. He sighed. I knew I loved you before we made the trip from Denver. The whole time I was worried I was coveting my brother's future wife. She snuggled up against him happily. 
I couldn't have married your brother after I met you. He deserved a woman who could love him with her whole heart. Is Melinda that woman? She is exactly that woman. I've seen her look at him too many times to think any differently. I hope it works out between them. Me, too. They both deserve the kind of happiness I'm feeling right now. He smiled as he kissed her forehead. I'm just glad we have a little boy to protect any girls that may come along. I don't know what I'd have done if you'd brought home a girl. She laughed. You'd have been fine with it. I would have. But I'd have worried about all the men in this world. Now you can just worry about teaching Jonathan to be a man who other men don't need to protect their daughters from. Patrick frowned. I'll get right to work on that. Epilogue June 1886 Ellen lowered herself carefully into the chair behind the desk in Patrick's office to respond to the letter she'd received that morning. She'd smiled when she saw Harriet's familiar scrawl. Dear Harriet, I am blessed. Jonathan is crawling now and getting into everything. I thank God every day for Angela, because without her, I wouldn't be able to keep up. The baby I'm carrying is weighing heavy on me. The midwife says I only have another couple of weeks to go, but I'm so huge now, I'm not sure if I'll fit through doorways in another two weeks. Patrick loves being a father. He dotes on little Jonathan and comes home earlier and earlier every night. I really hope the baby I'm carrying is a girl, but Patrick is insistent it needs to be a boy. He thinks we need to have at least a dozen boys before we can have a girl. I hope this letter finds you well and happy. You'll have to let me know about your own adventures. Write to me when you arrive so I'll have your new address and can write to you. Thank you so much for everything you've done for Melinda and me. I really don't know what would have happened to us without you. You were truly our guardian angel. All my best, Ellen. Ellen folded the letter neatly and set it aside to be mailed out the following day. She rested her hands against her swollen stomach and smiled as Patrick stepped into the room. Glancing at the clock in surprise, she saw it was only 4.30. You're early. Patrick crossed the room to drop a kiss on her cheek. I couldn't stay away. He sat down on the desk facing her. How are you feeling? Round. I feel very very round. He laughed. It's almost over. He glanced over and saw the letter sitting on the corner of his desk. Writing to Harriet? She nodded, excitement dancing in her eyes. You'll never believe what she's decided to do.